with our hearts being uplifted by our wonderful choir. And that was beautiful. Will you rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel this morning? The Holy Gospel for the last Sunday of the church year is recorded in St. John, the 18th chapter. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. On this Sunday, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we come together as one church family, confessing as one the core truths of our Christian faith, and this morning, using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
the name of Christ. Amen. This morning I'd like to take a little time to look at our epistle reading out of Jude, the only chapter of Jude. The, uh, he was very concise, uh, in, or the author was very concise in writing to Jude. But this is the last Sunday of the church year. Our first reading began with the Old Testament reading from Isaiah 51, telling us about the judgment of God lifting our eyes to the heavens, the earth beneath, the vanishing of the heavens, the earth ending like a garment, but the salvation of God and his righteousness lasting forever. We speak about endings because this in the season of the church year is the last Sunday of the church year, not the calendar year, but the church year, the church year where we focus on Christ and the birth of Christ and the, the life of Christ given to us through the scripture and of course the second coming of Christ. So in this last Sunday of the church year, we focus on two things. We, we next week begin the series of Advent, and we then focus on the coming of Christ as the child of the manger, the first coming to this earth, well, the, the incarnation. And at the same time in this last Sunday, we focus on the next coming, the final coming, the return of Christ. Now, we talk about that a lot, and, and what amazes me <clears throat> is we are given very little detail in Scripture, well, no detail on when it's going to happen, little detail on how it's going to happen, but we're very clearly told we don't know when Christ will return for the second coming. We're told that flat out, completely, literally. No one knows. You will not know. And what amazes me is for much of Christianity, that's what we focus on. When is he coming back? I, I, I love that. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like scripture would have worked better if it just told us not to do all the things we were supposed to do and vice versa. But since the first century, We've been trying to figure out when Jesus would return. At the end of the first century, in, in 100 AD or thereabouts, pretty much every Christian believed Christ would return again in their lifetime. It was assumed he would come before they died. That didn't happen. In 365, uh, in, in 365 AD, a man by the name of Hilary Poitiers announced the end would happen that year. That didn't happen. 500 AD was the first year with a really good round number. And the anti-pope Hippolytus and some other ac academics predicted Armageddon during this year. Because 500, it's got to be 500, right? 1346 and later, the Black Plague came. There you go. It's the end. It's Armageddon. People were sure this was a prelude to the return of Christ. 1689, a very prominent 17th century Baptist predicted the end of the world for that year. In 1914, <clears throat> 1915, 1918, 1920, 1925, 1941, 1975, and 1994, and going on, uh, were just some of the dates that the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses predicted the end would come. You know, when they bring the little thing to your door, and it's, you know, the end is near. Um, I don't know if they're still predicting dates, but not a great track record. Here's another big one, 1948. The state of Israel was founded. Every Christian went off the charts. That's it, that's it. He's gonna return. No. 1978, the famous Chuck Smith, pastor of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, said there's strong evidence the end would occur in 1981. Then Pat Robertson, the great televangelist, not to be outdone, said it's gonna come in fall of 1982. 1988, Hal Lindsey predicted in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth. He's coming back in 1988, because it's one generation or 40 years after the creation of the state of Israel. You can get that book very cheap now, by the way. Um, uh, the, uh, well, the year 2000, come on, we all thought he was coming back in the year 2000. I mean, the computers were gonna break. What was the point of living anyways? 
One of my favorites, though, is, is in 2004, October 17th, a guy by the name of Kay Cantrell computes the date of the end from the size of Noah's Ark with particular attention to the precise location of the escape window in the top of the vessel and said the world would end in 2004. And lastly, in 2006, when the books The Bible Code came out, they quickly determined that the secret codes in the Bible said Christ would return in 2006. Uh, unless we are sadly mistaken, they were all wrong. In fact, it's probably going to get to a point where after they've predicted every single date in here, maybe we can predict it by maybe the one time nobody predicts. But this morning, we're not worrying about when Christ is going to return. We're worrying about what to do in the meantime. This text this morning is talking about the fact that he is going to return, but there's a middle point there. There was a beginning and there will be an end. There was a beginning of the creation. There will be an end of this now sinful creation. There was a beginning of your life. There will be an end of your life. What about the middle? What about the meantime? That's what Jude is talking, or the, the book of Jude is talking about here this morning. That middle part. What do we do in the meantime? So instead of focusing on what date, what time, which we're told we cannot figure out, Instead of figuring out how it's all going to work when Jesus comes back, how big a cloud will he arrive on, and will you be able to see it on TV? And but What if we just focus on now, the meantime, the middle part between birth and death, between the beginning and the end, between the resurrection and the return? And that's what Jude, verse 20 through 25, is talking about. And it starts off in verse 20 with this statement. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith. Let's take a minute and look at that first part. You, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Well, there's a start. Rather than trying to predict the day, the time, the hour when Jesus is coming back or figuring that all out, Jude tells us, build up in faith. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. That means, number one, you start with remembering you are beloved. So whenever Christ returns, and he will, in your baptism, in your faith, you are beloved. And that is a very important word. It's not that you're liked, because let's admit it, not all of us are always that likable. I'm, mornings, I'm not always likable. Not likable not a friend, not a connection, not an acquaintance. You are beloved. This is marriage language. You are mine. And I love you. But beloved brings with it the idea of a passionate love. You are beloved. You are beloved to me. And because of that, you build. And what does building mean? It means to grow. Building is the opposite of entropy. Building is the opposite of decay, of falling apart, of sleeping, of laying about. Building is growing. And all living things on this earth are either growing or dying. You notice that? There's no just, you know, paralyzed, frozen state. Well, maybe with few tiny little exceptions and some weird frogs that are able to freeze for the winter or something. But that's the meantime activity, growing and building. Notice also it says plural. Beloved, building yourselves in your most holy faith. Interesting also that word building is kind of interesting because the root word of that building is the Greek oikos, which means house. It's Inferring an actual building, you as part of a building, in other words, you as part of the church. But how does this happen? Is this by taking some sort of special class or is this by nails and hammers? No, it's building yourself up in faith. It's saying, because I trust, 
because I am beloved by this God, this Christ, I'm going to grow toward him. It's kind of like how when your children, the minute that your parents put out their hands like this and say, come on, you go. Unfortunately, you will go. You, regardless, you'll jump off a table, right? Have you ever seen that where a child will be standing on something way high up and as soon as they see their parent, they just jump. And you're like, no, 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 no. But they trust you. They are beloved to you. You will catch them. That means, beloved, that growing means taking risks. It means change. Now, change isn't always good. Some change can be downright dumb. Some change can be a bad idea. But there will always need to be change or there's no growth. Inside you or inside the people of God. And change that depends on trust, faith. That's risk. Change that depends on your confidence in money or your confidence in your abilities or you, you know, your confidence on your brilliance. Well, that doesn't take any risk. But change based on faith, that's risk. That means stepping out. But you are the beloved. What's going to happen? Christ will catch you. And some of us don't like this because we think, well... For example, maybe I'm too young, you know, some of the young people in the church are not talking to me, I, I'm too little for this. Completely forgetting people like David when he fought the giant or Timothy going into the ministry at such a young age encouraged by the Apostle Paul. You are not too young to take risks, to do things in the name of Christ that may seem impossible to you. And neither are you too old. I hear a lot of times in the church, well, we've got to get these young people in. We've got to get these young people in. Our people are, we've got all these old people in the church. Well, maybe. But I hate the idea that somehow that that's less good than a church filled with young people. You know, old people are loved by God too. And old people, as a matter of fact, according to scripture, are the ones we're supposed to rise for, honor. Us old people have a lot to offer. Even old people like Abraham, Noah, even you, if you consider yourself too old. You are not too old to take risks to change in faith with Christ. You are never too old to take that leap to say, in my faith, I know that this will build the kingdom of God and I'm going to leap. There's a poem I've always loved uh, by Tennyson called Ulysses and a part of it reads, it is not too late to seek a newer world, push off and sitting well in order smite. The sounding furrows for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and never to yield. Old or young, we are growing, changing, building. That's what we do in the meantime, not from ourselves, in our faith. Number two, verse 20 says, and praying in the Holy Spirit. The second thing the text mentions in this meantime is prayer. And you say, well, yes, prayer, that, that's good. But wait a minute, what is this praying in the Holy Spirit? Well, where do we find the Holy Spirit most objectively? Now, he, he's everywhere. But as far as knowing exactly what he's up to and what he's doing, that can be very difficult. A lot of people like to do that and pretend like there's some magic way that we can just channel him through the right chant or the right song or the right something. 
and of course uh, never confusing him with our emotions we do confuse him with our emotions but there is one way we can avoid that the place where we are promised the Holy Spirit objectively always the Word of God have you ever thought about praying the Word of God that instead of just praying in ourselves which of course it's always okay more than okay it's great to just talk to God but have you ever thought that during this waiting time this mean time this middle time of actually opening your scripture and praying starting with the Holy Spirit what does scripture say and is that your prayer so many times people say I, I want to know God's will for my life and they pray for God's will in their life well God has given you his will it's the scripture have you ever thought of opening the Holy Scripture and praying make this happen in my life may I be this in you then we get to verse 21 keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and have mercy on those who doubt save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear hating even the garment stained by the flesh verse 21 keep yourselves in the love of God how by waiting we keep ourselves in the love of God during this middle time this mean time not running away from the love of God but staying in the love of God and we do that by our favorite activity waiting according to verse 21 I hate waiting hate it hate it hate it hate it that is probably my greatest uh, well maybe not my greatest fault my wife is here uh, sh she could give you a list but waiting is not my favorite thing I, I uh, hate waiting much uh, many of the millions of dollars at theme parks like Disneyland have gone into figuring out how to help people not wait as long because they know how much people hate it but this text tells us that we wait patiently but not paralyzed there's there's a way that we wait and how is that mercy mercy it says waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life that is the key to between the beginning of our life and the end the resurrection of Christ and his return is mercy that is our relationship with him that is how we keep ourselves in the love of God we don't go to God and say uh, God you should love me because I have so much to offer you God here's a list of reasons why you should love me God how much would it cost for you to love me we go to God and say please love me out of mercy have mercy on me Lord because I do not deserve your love I do not even deserve your gaze I need mercy that's how we wait we wait by looking at ourselves and realizing we need mercy from our Lord and we need it from each other mercy we are sinners bad sinners we are selfish 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 half the time we don't even know it we need mercy keeping ourselves in the love of God is simply saying I don't deserve it please love me anyways and the same applies to being with the people of the church all who share in the building of this house the same thing I wish you would love me I don't deserve it but not only or not only are we to wait for mercy we're to save with mercy we're to give mercy to others that is how we stay in this middle time is mercy to us and mercy from us because as we receive mercy if we are receiving mercy if we are expecting mercy it is going to overflow from us and we treat each other with mercy not bitterness and anger and hatred and as I always like to say nya, 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 nya. mercy you are forgiven 
I have mercy. This person hurt me, mercy. This person intimidates me, mercy. This person, I, I know they don't like me. I know they don't think very highly. Mercy, mercy, mercy. I'll never, from one of my strongest memories of being a little boy is I got mad uh, at my dad. And my mom had died about a year before. And uh, so I must have been like almost eight years old. And uh, I decided to run away from home because I was frustrated at something. And I said, that's it, I'm running away. And I took off running. And uh, I got all the way up the street. Uh, it couldn't have been more than a quarter mile, but they were doing some building of new tract homes up the way. So I finally got tired and just kind of hid behind a pile of dirt and sat there and, and you know, muttered and mad and, you know, I don't have to put up with this. You know, I'm almost eight for goodness sakes. Um, should get my own place. And uh, I was sitting there for probably a whole of 15 minutes before my father found me and my dad's car pulled up. He could have walked, but you know, he took the car. Car pulled up and he opened the door. And he could have yelled at me, could have said, you get in this car and you get home. But you know what he said? He just said, come on, let's go get some pizza. He had mercy. And plus, how in the world was I going to turn down some pizza? But what if we treated each other like that? Wouldn't the weight be better? So as we look at this beautiful chapter of the Holy Scripture. And as we, we look at this last Sunday of the church year, we have a wonderful little model of how we are to wait in the meantime. How we are to get through the middle between the resurrection and the return. And what to do instead of just sitting there and trying to figure out the day, the manner, the time. But this is how we ought to live. And the text ends by telling us exactly how we can make these rather difficult tasks happen. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. This is who we are in him. This is how we wait in him. This is how we pray in him. Let me conclude with this thought. Someday you and I are going to die. And it will be our ending. And there will be a funeral, likely, for us. I'd like you to imagine that funeral. Imagine what people will say about the time between your beginning and your ending. Is it going to be a, just a slideshow of maybe the vacations you took, your hobbies, your favorite sports, some funny things that you did, dinners over at your house? Or will people remember most how you grew, how you grew and were built in your faith as part of Christ's holy church and the risks that you took because of your faith? Will they remember how you prayed? How you prayed not just for your own selfish needs, but through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, and for His will to be done? Will they remember how you were made perfect through the mercy of Christ and only through the mercy of Christ and will they remember how you showed that mercy to others? Will people remember that mercy overflowed from you? It's completely possible, no matter how young or how old, for that to be the case. Because of him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. When? that end comes. This is the last Sunday of the church year. We live in the meantime. May the peace of Christ be with you. Will you stand as we pray?